in topic one, we introduced stress and strain. These two variables are related because application of a stress results in a strain. In this topic, we will see how a specimen of intact rock responds when it's uh, subjected to a simple compression. So if we consider a specimen such as this one with flat ends and we compress this specimen, so that could be represented as this little sketch here. So we have the specimen subjected to compression. And as the specimen is stressed, it, it deforms. So the mechanical response can be plotted in a stress, sigma, strain, epsilon plane. It typically involves an initial nonlinear part where stress and increases with strain nonlinearly and is now after that followed by a linear evolution where stress is proportional to strain. Progressively, as we increase the stress, the rock starts to not be able to cope with the amount of stress anymore and that would lead to progressive failure where the specimen breaks into pieces. The failure can be brittle, like glass breaking, and would have a response like this, where the load suddenly falls. But the specimen could also sustain the load, where we'd have then a plateau there, or even we could observe a slight increase in, in the load past this inflection point here. From this mechanical response, we can determine the unconfined compressive strength of the rock. This corresponds to the peak value sustained by the rock specimen. And we can read the value here on the stress axis. However, this value, which is a resistance in compression, is not enough to fully characterize the strength of the rock. Take, for example, this rock specimen, which is uh, broken here. It certainly has some strength in compression, but there is no strength in traction. So this shows that strength has to be considered relative to loading conditions. In fact, in many engineering applications, another failure mechanism prevails. It's called shear, and it's a form of resistance to sliding. Consider this rock slope with discontinuities you can see on this figure. If the block highlighted in yellow detaches from the face, it would slide. And that shows that the discontinuity is not subjected to tension or compression. This type of loading is called shear, and it occurs when the forces acting on the specimen are not aligned anymore. So when it comes to the strength of a rock, it's usually required to quantify the unconfined compressive strength, or also called UCS, the tensile strength, typically noted sigma t, Sigma T is typically lower than about a tenth of the unconfined compressive strength. And we also have these shear strengths uh, we've just mentioned with the, in, uh, with the previous picture. The thing is, this shear strength is not a unique value, and this can be illustrated using this uh, coming picture. If you consider two blocks resting on a surface, flat surface, one block made of wood, one block made of concrete, you would have more difficulties pushing and sliding the concrete block than the timber block because the concrete block is heavier than the timber block. So that shows that to some extent the sliding resistance or the resistance offered by the surface depends very much on the amount of compressive stress applied perpendicular to the sliding direction. So the shear strength is not unique. And in fact, going back to the analogy of pushing a block, we should actually measure the shear strengths for different values of weight of blocks or vertical stress applied to the surface. And by plotting of all the values of shear strengths against the vertical stress we've applied, we can form a failure criterion. So, Unconfined compressive strengths, tensile strengths, and the failure criterion of shear strengths will provide all the information we need on the strengths of the rock. Because strength is the maximum value of stress the material can sustain, it is independent from the geometry of the specimen tested. That's the definition of stress we've seen in topic one. 
for strengths fully characterize the material, regardless of the geometry. In topic one, we said that it's important to assess how a material deforms under a load. To do so, we need the material's deformability. This can be inferred from the stress-strain curve we have drawn um, before. Let's draw this curve again for a case of simple compression. So we have stress as vertical axis, strain as horizontal axis, and the response we drew before was something like this. The deformability of the material is typically um, assessed, quantified, through the coefficient of proportionality between stress and strain, which is called E, and is the Young's modulus. So when it comes to engineering, this nonlinear part is typically neglected, and we simply consider that stress equals E times strain. E is a very critical information to relate stress and strain. So let me explain this E a bit more to you. E is called the Young's modulus. Young's modulus. And we have a relationship between stress, sigma, equals to E times epsilon. We said sigma as a unit of Pascal. We said strain as no unit, hence E as unit of Pascal. Pascal as well. Because stress and strain characterize the material regardless of the geometry of the specimen we've tested, so does E. E is an inherent property of the material regardless of the geometry of the specimen we've used to obtain this response. So now let's have a look at what happens in the direction perpendicular to loading. So that is, for example, if we load a specimen vertically, what happens in the horizontal direction? And let's start with an experiment. Let's take this rubber band and we're going to stretch it. Look at how wide it is and look at what happens to the width as we stretch it. We can clearly see that the rubber band narrows as we pull on it. If we had a specimen subjected to compression, the opposite would occur. As the specimen gets shorter, it would bulge and get thicker. This is illustrated in this picture. So the vertical strain and horizontal strains are related. They are in fact proportional and the coefficient of proportionality is called Poisson's ratio. So we have the horizontal strain divided by the vertical strain equals minus Poisson's ratio. The Poisson's ratio, noted nu, ranges from 0.1 typically to 0.4 for rocks and a typical value would be around 0.3. You can notice uh, a negative sign on the equation uh, we showed on the picture. This is to reflect the fact that a compression in one direction creates uh, an elongation in the other and vice versa. So in conclusion, knowing the properties of rock materials such as strength and deformability is critical when it comes to designing a structure on a rock mass. In the next topic, I will present you some of the laboratory tests we can conduct to infer the strengths of rock material.